Hey, what's going on, guys? Today's episode is about a guy bouncing back from difficult times and using subject to investing to take on the world and do well enough that he lives in Panama right now, which is just super cool. Jim Brooks is an awesome guy. I'm really excited about this episode. If this is your first time joining us, thanks for listening. If not, awesome. Welcome back. Be sure to check out the show notes at militarytomillionaire.com slash podcast. Now relax and enjoy the show. You're listening to the Military Millionaire Podcast, a show about real estate investing for the working class. Stay tuned as we explore ways to help you improve your finances, build wealth through real estate, and become a person that is worth knowing. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Dave, and I am here with Jim Brooks, who has been both in the Marine Corps and the Army and has a very unique story. And he's done well enough with real estate that if you can see his background right now on YouTube, he's living in the jungle in Panama, paid for by his property, scuba diving every day, which is just super cool. So Jim, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Dave. Um, well, I can tell you I did 10 in the Corps and 13 in the Army. Um, I was, uh, when I was in the Corps, I did uh, infantry, I did recon, got out for a few years, uh, finished my, my bachelor's degree, ended up in the Army Reserves, did 13 years, special ops, special forces, ended up going to Afghanistan, I was with 7th Group in Afghanistan, up in the Hindu Kush Mountains, northern Afghanistan, doing horseback missions. Awesome. That, that was really cool. Um, I got a bachelor's, bachelor's degree in animal science and I was a horse trainer for several years and I got uh, my certification for special ed and I was a certified special ed teacher for a few years. Um, I ended up having a, a pre-deployment accident and uh, had a, uh, somebody sky shark me, came up underneath me and uh, my parachute collapsed. I had a parachuting accident in 2009 uh, and they ended up retiring me. Um, but Military career was over, uh, did a little bit of teaching after that, uh, and then finally I just said, you know what, uh, it's about time I just go ahead and just enjoy life. So I went ahead and, and uh, I'm doing nothing now but just the real estate, and the real estate is doing well. But that is pretty much my uh, uh, military background. Uh, my investing career started when I was 38. Up until, up until the time that I was 38, I was married, had three kids. <clears throat> thought that the way to get to head and getting ahead was uh, working two jobs, taking night school. So I worked for years. I mean, as long as I can remember, I was working two jobs and taking night classes. And uh, every time I'd get, you know, another little accomplishment and a little accomplishment, but it never amounted to any kind of the financial, you know, getting ahead that I was hoping for. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, and all the way up until, you know, I got deployed uh, to Afghanistan. I come back and I was 38, you know, I was on the backside of my military career. <clears throat> my grandfather, he, he called me up and says, hey, what are you going to do now that you're back from the war? I said, I'm going to drink beer and fish. <laughs> and he says, oh, hell, you hate fishing. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he says, uh, he says, why don't you come hang out with me for a little bit and visit? And he introduced me to uh, a couple of uh, CDs, uh, you know, cassette tapes from one of, you know, the big icons of real estate investing. I can't even remember who it is offhand, <clears throat> but I listened to that and listened to that and studied that. And it, it opened up my eyes to another possibility that I had not learned about. You know, a high school does not teach you about finance. No. High school teaches you how to get a job and how to work for someone else that understands finance. So uh, I started, you know, I did the, the Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, and every other real estate book that I could find, and just just kept working, kept studying, kept learning. Um, I was still working a, a day job when I got back. You know, I was uh, doing some substitute teaching and, and just work where I could, when I could. <clears throat> and one day, uh, I, I got a lead, and I responded to the lead. And he accepted my offer and I bought a house and I would, I was pretty much amazed because I didn't, you know, I was my first one <clears throat> and I made him the most ridiculous offer. 
I mean, I was so embarrassed about this ridiculous offer that I didn't even want to answer the phone when he called me back. But it was my first subject to deal, my very first deal. And <clears throat> we, we had, when I got back from Afghanistan, we had sold my horse ranch uh, outside of San Antonio. So we had really no place to live and I didn't have a job, so I couldn't just move into a house anywhere. So we were living with family while I was trying to get back on my feet ended up getting this deal and my wife said, we're moving in. So we moved into my first deal and I just did the same thing with the very next decent lead that came along. And a couple months later I bought another one, same thing. And it was a subject to deal. And uh, I spent from the time my grandfather introduced me to real estate, I spent a good year studying, learning, working on marketing uh, and what I did was I created a funnel by getting a real estate website and uh, I did that through Dustin Griffin with uh, what it's street smart super smart super smart web profits yeah super smart web profits got a website real estate website and then I would put up bandit signs I had a sign on my truck I had uh, business cards that I would accidentally drop in Walmart when I was walking around. <clears throat> I was putting, I mean, I, I bought the big box, so I had too many. So I would I stop at a gas station. I'd be sticking them up on the, on the little thing. I was dropping cards everywhere. Uh, so I did the, the business cards. I did uh, the, the bandit signs. I sent letters and some direct mail marketing, but I was funneling everything to my website. So everything was funneling. And then I would get an email that says you got new leads. And then I would go to my website and I would look at them and I would go down the leads and say, okay, that one's good. That one's good. You know, and the rest of these are all, all junk. I was looking for motivated sellers, people that were willing, if they were in a bind, willing to work something out. So that was the first and second deal that I did, which were both uh, subject to deals. And <clears throat> they worked out real well. And from there, I just kept doing it, kept doing it. And then I would expand a little bit, learn a little bit more uh, and try something else. And I would keep following up with my lead. Somebody would call me up and they say, hey, I've got a, well, I didn't done the phone, but I get an email and I go to the lead that they submitted through my website. And I would look at it and I would say, you know, uh, this is the best I can do. And they would come back and say, okay. And then I'm like, I'm gonna have to call you back. And I'd hang up the phone and I'm like, they did not just agree to that. <laughs> so, uh, and, and <clears throat> so it's been, it's been interesting. And I ended up getting up to where we had 50 properties. We had a, a, a fourplex, we had a threeplex and a bunch of duplexes and a total of 50 properties, not 50 units. We had 50 properties and uh, we were, we were rolling. I mean, we were doing so well that, I mean, <clears throat> and the thing about the subject too, you, when you get it, you get it for zero down. So I was putting nothing into buying this property and I bought one and it was down in San Antonio and it was like two or three days before we were heading down to San Antonio, to go to SeaWorld. So I was taking the wife and kids down and I said, well, I just got to make a couple stops along the way. So I stopped off at Fort hood and I closed on a deal, picked up a check for 2,500. It was a house that I had bought the week before and put nothing down. So I picked up a check for 2,500 when I did a lease option on it, drove down to San Antonio, stayed at the Hilton, uh, got them all settled. And then I said, I'll be right back. I got to go run an errand. So I went over to Converse and closed the house. And these people had had their house on the market for six months and their contract was up, but they had already bought a new house. So they were kind of in a, in a little bit of a time crunch. And I looked at their, their, their information on the lead sheet and it said that they owed a certain amount, but they owed what their balance was. That's what they were asking. The asking price was with the balance on the mortgage. <clears throat> and I asked them, I said, well, how are you going to pay the, the realtor? I said, your commission was going to be $10,000. And they said, oh, we took out an extra loan. So we got $10,000 uh, sitting here. But, you know, if you're going to buy it, then we don't have to pay the realtor. And I said, so are you going to help me with my closing costs? And they said, what do you want? I said, $5,000. They said, okay. I had to put the phone down. <laughs> really? They said, okay. So I bought a house and made $5,000. <laughs> and went back 
and uh, put put the thing on uh, on uh, Craigslist or whatever. However, I was marketing. I don't even remember. Um, and then the next morning, we got up. We went to SeaWorld. We had a great time. We came back. Everybody's tired. I get on, and I got somebody that says, "Hey, I'll give you five thousand dollars. You'll you know do a lease option with this house." Okay. So I said, I'll be right back. So I ran over to Converse, did a little contract with him, collected a check for $5,000 and, and went back to it. So, I mean, I made $12,500 on a vacation weekend. <laughs> and I had, it was closing on two properties that I bought and I had put zero down on them. Um, it, I, I mean, it, it just don't get too much better than that. I, I bought another one in San Antonio, uh, zero down. Uh, the guy was military. He was said, look, I'm leaving like tomorrow. I've had it on the market. I buy it, but all I'm going to do is buy the house by taking over the mortgage. I'll take over the existing financing for the balance that you have. I said, you're not going to pay any out-of-pocket expenses, no closing costs, no fees. I said, but I'm not giving you any money. He's like, so he says, next month I don't have a payment? And I said, no, next month you don't have a payment. He says, done. Where do I sign? right here <laughs> you sign right here <clears throat> so three or four days later i had someone giving me ten thousand dollars to move into that house so i had that much into it and i just get a check for ten thousand dollars a few days later so like i was saying you know when we had 50 of these things we were doing pretty good so for the first time in my in my life i guess i was probably about 40 and, you know, we'd always been, you know, long on month and short on money. And I was finally able to, to, to say, hey, baby, where do you want to go? Anywhere you want to go. We'd pick up a condo down in, down in Florida and go down there and stay on the very top floor, nicest room they had. We, me and my wife got a three-bedroom, two-bath condo. They had the one-bedroom. <laughs> but I said, oh, hell no. I want the three-bedroom. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. It was just, you know, for the first time in my life, I was actually able, I had a little bit of money and it, it was good. I, I, I called down to, uh, to a dealership in Tyler, uh, Tyler, Texas. And I, I, I said, you on your, your, your uh, website, you've got a, a Hummer that you're selling. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Would you like to come down and look at it? I'm like, no, I don't want to look at it. I said, go ahead and I'm signing for it here. I just want it delivered to my house tomorrow all done. And when my wife came back from the store, there's a Hummer sitting there in the driveway. And she's like, whose is that? I said, it's yours. Happy birthday. And she's like, no, don't mess with me. I'm like, no, it's yours. Happy birthday. And it took her a while. She just sat in it for like an hour. You couldn't get her out of there with, you know, you couldn't tug her. She was not getting out of that car. Uh, you know, and then I ended up going from, from driving my old piece of junk. I had a, a 3,500 uh, Dodge Dually with a Cummins turbo diesel, four wheel drive lifted with a big 35s on bought me a, a, a big house. Well, uh, that's later down the road, but uh, we were doing good. We, we were doing good. And then because I was still in the reserves, um, I was getting ready to deploy again. And I had a parachuting accident and shattered my femur. The doctor said that I had uh, broken the largest and strongest bone in my body and shattered it as if it was a light bulb, a light bulb. He goes, you are lucky to be alive. I didn't feel real lucky at that time. <laughs> I would or, imagine not. It sucked. Yeah. Uh, I can definitely tell you bumbles bounce, but I am not a bumble. I hit the ground and I just laid there and I hurt. And then the wind picked up and started dragging me across the drop zone. So I'm holding my leg saying, Oh, my leg. Oh, my leg. You know, then I'm like, okay, I got to reach up, hit my parachute release. And I just leg to the chute release. Really finally, I just, pulled it and laid there thinking, God, am I dead? This hurts. <clears throat> so it took me three years and multiple surgeries for them to get it fixed and uh, for me to be able to walk again. And now I can walk pretty good. I still get kind of tired on that side every now and then. Uh, so they retired me in September 2012. And then February the following year, my wife was diagnosed with cancer. And that was probably, you know, you know, I've been to combat and I've been through more stupid stuff than most people have, but that was a kick in the guts. Yeah. Really bad. And uh, a year and a half later, she passed away in my arms. Very hard day. Yeah. I stopped caring about everything. My, my, my kids were actually coming by because they had already, you know, grown up, moved out. <clears throat> they would come by just to see if I was still alive, if I was eating 
because I, I hadn't been. My daughter actually moved in with me and started making sure that I was eating. Uh, so yeah, I had a rough spot there for about 14 months. And then one day I said, you know what? It's about time I get up and get going again. And fortunately, because I learned real estate, it wasn't like starting over again. It wasn't, it, it wasn't starting at zero with that big learning curve. It was basically just turning on the engine, you know, and getting it going again. I didn't have to build the truck. I just had to get in and crank it up and just kind of pay attention to where I was going. And with that, uh, that's been almost two years. I've got 21 properties right now, uh, working on a few more deals and the money that we have coming in from our real estate has us sitting in this massive, uh, house. It's like a tree house up in the mountains of the jungle overlooking the Caribbean which unfortunately you can't see behind me, but it's amazing. If you could see it. Yeah. We tried before we uh, recorded and it's just, there's yes, too much, it's, uh, it's too sunny out there. It just doesn't come through the camera. Yeah. It's, but there's 11 sailboats just right outside my window. Uh, actually going to go. I, I told you before that I was actually either going to take some money and, and put all this money that I've been saving into uh, another property or I was going to buy a sailboat. We're going to look at a sailboat tomorrow. I have to. At least look. I, have to. I, I totally understand. That's awesome. Yeah, and everybody, can, don't buy a boat. Don't buy a boat. You know, there's eleven of them. A wise friend of mine who is now retired from the military told me, "Don't buy a boat unless you got money and way too much time on your hands." And I don't know about way too much time, but it sounds like you've got the time that you could handle a boat. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm down in Panama for about three months or longer, or if I decide to leave, I'll leave. Um, you know, and I'm scuba diving every day. I mean, we just, I did two dives this morning. Uh, yesterday we did two dives and uh, tomorrow we're going to do a night dive. So I'm just, we're hanging out just enjoying life. It's good. I get on the, the, my computer every morning. I look to see what leads I have. I follow up on them. Uh, I've been working with my kids trying to teach them uh, how to do real estate deals. Uh, I was talking with my son earlier today, as a matter of fact, because he's working on two of them right now. Um, my, my daughter, I, she was working on short sales with me back when I was actually doing, doing short sales. I closed on some short sales, made some good money until the banks caught on. You know, banks are greedy, man. <laughs> They're going to squeeze you for every little penny they can get. You know, I always leave a little money on the table. I want everybody to be happy. Uh, that banks, they just want to squeeze you. Yeah, absolutely. But I've, I've done, I've done some uh, wholesaling. I've done short sales. I've flipped houses. Uh, I had a, I tied up one in uh, Bossier City, Louisiana, and talked her down from fifteen thousand down to five with a thirty day inspection period. Two a, two days later, uh, two or three days later, I sold it for ten thousand dollars. So I gave her her five, and I had my five. You know, and the, the, the thing about wholesaling or flipping, you know, yeah, you can do it. You can make a little quick money off of it, but you have to keep doing it. And then you have to keep doing it if you want to keep money coming in. You know, I like buying a house with subject to is my favorite um, and turn around and doing a lease option or owner financing and have that money coming in every month was me being able to just hang out in Panama yes. and scuba dive and not have to worry about it rather than have to keep that hustle going all the time. So that's one of the reasons it's subject to, I, I like to buy and hold. I was going to say, can because, you, uh, I mean, if, if, oh, sorry. I was, I was going to ask if you could uh, explain subject to a little bit to some of our listeners. Cause I know, you know, I know what it is, but some people that's, that's kind of a, a very niche style of investing that not everyone knows about. This is true. This is true. It's, it's, and, you know, when, when someone said somebody will give you their house, they will give you the deed and the mortgage will stay in their name. I said, no, no. Who in their right mind is going to give me a house and leave the mortgage in their name. But I, I think it was Lou Brown or Ron Legrand. One of them said, if, if you're going through a divorce, if, you know, you're, if you have two house payments because you just moved, you're stressed. You're not in your right mind. You're looking for relief and you're looking for someone to give you that relief. So I will come in and I will say, okay, you have this house and it's causing you, you know, causing you some problems. I will 
purchase your house for the balance on the mortgage by taking over the existing financing. And yes, it's, I'm going to get the deed. The mortgage is going to stay in your name uh, until I can refinance it or, or, or pay it off or resell it or, or whatever we decide to do with it at that point. And you know, they're like, you know, Hey, I've got an extra $900 a month payment that I just can't afford. So they said that that's relief. That's $900 worth of relief that I'm willing to take on. So they say, you know, give me the papers. So I send them the papers. They look over them all. They sign them. They notarize them. They send them back to me. I now have the deed to that house. I now own that house. So I turn around and market it as a lease option or owner financing. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I had, before I got on, I had a buyer lead for one of the houses that we have that's coming available. And the lady said she's got $8,000 that she can put down. So I buy a house for zero, then I lease option it to her for $8,000 down. You can't even calculate the return on investment when you have zero that you put down. That's I mean, so unless cool. you want to say how much energy does it take for me to email a contract <laughs> to someone, you know? But other than that, you can't even calculate a return on investment. You know, people are saying, oh yeah, I can get you 15%. Okay, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm making million percent yeah, or whatever I, I'm doing infinite return. Yeah, don't, don't need that fifteen percent. But thank you very much. I, I went into to my banker, and I, I sat down, and she was like, "Oh, hey, can I can I interest in, you in some of our programs? We've got this, and we've got this, and we've got this." And I looked at her, and I'm like, "Stacy, I said, you know, I do real estate, right?" I said, you know that I buy houses, and then I market them, and I do lease options and owner finances. And she goes, "Oh, I forgot. This will be a waste of your time." <laughs> You know, it, and it is. Uh, I had someone that was trying to sell me on, on something here a little while ago. I can't even remember what it was called. Um, and, oh, you can get a 12, 13, 14% return on your money. No, no, no. It, that's, that's not going to work. Um, it, you know, I, I like subject to. It, it's, it's simple. It's uh, no money down. I mean, you always hear people say, oh, no money down deals, no money down deals. This is a no money down deal. I mean, if you use your VA, if you use the VA, get a loan and do some of the house hacking. Yeah, that's a no money down deal. Yep. Well, this is the same thing, except I'm not going to the bank. I'm not asking anybody for a loan with, if I'm buying it subject to, you know, you go down as an investor to the bank and you say, I want to buy this house as a loan property. Well, boom, they're already going to bump it up. You know, you're going to be paying an extra two or three points on it just because it's an investment property. I'm getting them at the owner rate because this guy went and he put in for a mortgage. He got approved for the loan. He got a 3% uh, and now he's gone. Now he's in a bind. So he just deeds it over to me. So now I've got a 3% note. I can turn around and owner finance it at 9%. Yeah. Man, that's so cool. And, and it's really cool because when you, you lease option or you owner finance, you're no longer on the hook for the maintenance and everything. So you're just bringing in po passive cash flow off. Someone is handing you a check to pay you continually for something you didn't pay a penny for, which is just super exactly, cool. exactly. Yes. That, that's one of the reasons that I like subject to, um, I get it for, for zero down and I turn around and get five to $10,000 down on it to do a lease option, which means that it's still mine, but they've got the option, a three year option to go down and get a new loan. I've been doing this for 15 years. I haven't had anybody go down and get a new loan. That, that house I told you about in San Antonio that I had made 5,000 when they gave it to me. And then the other guy said, I'll give you 5,000, you know, and, and after one year, he called me up and said, oh, we got to move. I'm like, dude, you gave me $5,000 for a three-year lease option. He goes, yeah, but my job is moving me over here. Will you take the house back? Well, yeah, it appreciated like 6%. You've paid down the mortgage for a whole year. So now my mortgage is less. So I'm going to bump it up 6%, put it back out there as a lease <laughs> option again. And within a week, somebody else gave me $5,000 down. I made $15,000 on that house and was still getting $200, $250 a month. That's so cool. <laughs> I love lease options. I really do. Yeah, that's 
That's awesome. I've heard of uh, people doing like the lease option sandwich before, but subject two sounds better to me because it, well, for one, it's a little bit less complicated, but you actually own the asset. You're not leasing it from someone. You own the asset. They, so. they sign over the deed to you. And, you know, so now I own the house and then I lease option it. And people will ask me, hey, would you just rent to me? No, <laughs> no. If I rent to you, then if it's $900 a month, you're going to give me 900 deposit and $900, but that 900 I'm supposed to hold and give back to you. You know, if you give me a $5,000 non-refundable deposit and you're responsible for the maintenance and repairs. Yep. That beats renting the property any day. Absolutely. I have no repairs that I have to cover. Nobody calls me when their toilet is backed up. Nobody, well, I actually did have someone call me and say, hey, uh, we got a problem with our roof, it's leaking. Is that my responsibility or yours? And I said, you wanna keep your lease option? Oh yeah, then it's yours, fix it. <laughs> you know, I have insurance on it, so if it ends up going over the, over the deductible, then they pay the balance on it. Uh, but I have no maintenance or repair issues because I do the, the lease options and uh, owner financing. In Texas, you have to do the owner financing because they've got this whole weird thing going on with the, the lease options. They basically made it to where it's damn near impossible to do a lease option because somehow somebody got offended or something. I don't know. Yeah. You know how that works. Somebody got upset about something. Somebody looked at me funny or whatever. So, <laughs> you know, somebody got in there and decided, okay, lease options are now the devil. So you can no longer do lease options. Owner financing so, is still owner awesome. Financing. I owner finance it. I, I owner financed one and I had, uh, she's had it for two years, I think. And she called me up the other day and says, I'm thinking I'm going to have to leave. Will you take the house back? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. And that, what's cool is that because you do it all through email, you can do it while you're down in Panama. Yes. Uh, as long as I've got an internet connection, I'm good. You know, I, I really don't do a lot with my phone. Other than, you know, like play on Facebook and stuff. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, most of my stuff is uh, through email. That, like I said, um, you know, you, you put out the marketing. So, uh, you know, you put out your, your bandit signs or you have the, the, you know, different internet marketing or you have a billboard or you have cards or whatever. Um, and you do the marketing. You could send out, my, my son right now is sending letters out like it, like, like, there ain't no tomorrow. He's sending out letters. He's been burning out like 50 a day. And for a week or two, he was just like, dad, I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard anything yesterday. He's like, I've already got two people that have called me today. He's like, Oh, I've got someone else has called me. What do I do? So I'm going over <laughs> each little step and, and trying to help him out with it. But as long as you set up your, your marketing, I, I don't like calling people. I, I really yeah. don't. Uh, it's like, Hey, I see your house is for sale. I'm in the middle of watching Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm offering you money. Like, yeah, why are you being angry? <laughs> you're the one to put the house up that said it's for sale. I'm calling you about the house and you're yelling at me because you're in the middle of watching TV. Do you want to sell the house or not? I, I don't, I don't care. You know, if, if you don't, somebody else will. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, it, it's, I got so tired of calling people. I said, you know what I'm doing wrong? I said, what I'm doing wrong is I'm calling these people about their houses for sale. I said, what I need is for people to call me and beg me to take their houses. So I need to find people that were motivated, people that are in a bind that needed to sell their houses. And that's pretty much what I've been marketing to. But if I, I was putting up bandit signs, I was sending out letters, I had my cards. Right now, most of my marketing is, is just pretty much on the internet. So I don't actually have to get up every day and send letters or do any of that, it, but it's still fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. I did. Matter of fact, I had, I had one, I put up a sign in Walmart parking lot in, in uh, uh, Sulphur Springs, Texas. And I had this, this uh, lady call me up and it was at least a dollars $130,000 house fully furnished because their sister had died. She died in a nursing home, but her sisters, there was three of them didn't want to come in and have to sort through all the stuff. So we went over, we looked at it and we're just like, most of this stuff is antiques. This, you know, it had a little bit of a foundation problem on one side and I'm just like, okay, I, I did a little bit of research and I said, okay, uh, I think like I said, Lou Brown or Ron Legrand or someone, he said, if you're not embarrassed when you make an offer, 
then you're making an offer that's too high. Yeah. I said, okay. I said, I know this house is $125,000, $130,000 house. I said, but I know there's $50,000 worth of stuff in that house. So I said, I'll give you $50,000 for this house. I said, but I need six months before I give you the money. I said, so I'm going to get the contract now. I get possession of the house now. In six months, I will have it cleaned up, painted. All the stuff will be gone. And then I can turn around and sell it and pay you in six months. And they said, well, let me talk to my sisters and I'll get back with you. I was so embarrassed about this offer that I never even called them back. Never called them back uh, because I'm just like, no, there's no way, you know, I don't want to get cussed at or yelled at or them. You know, I just, I, I didn't have the, the, the balls to, to listen to this, you know, uh, the rejection is hard for anybody. Yeah. Especially when you're making stupid offers. So I'm standing in Dallas at a bookstore and my phone rings and I, I answered the phone and it was that same lady. And she goes, Mr. Brooks, she goes, I have been looking for you for a month. We agreed to your offer, but we couldn't find you and you never called us back. So we gave your offer to someone else and sold the house to him. Ugh. And I'm standing with the phone in hand. My mouth is open. My wife walks up to me. She goes, what's that? What happened? What's the matter? So I told her and my wife hit me. She called me some names. I'm not going to repeat the names. <laughs> you know, so it, 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 that was kind of you know, like, holy crap, I could have had a $125,000 house for damn near nothing. Yeah. Because I sold the antiques, given them the money, house have been free and clear, it's all mine. Didn't follow up on it. Somebody else got that deal because I was too embarrassed to call back and check on it. So yeah, following up can, I've, I've actually been in situations like that where I'm like, man, I don't want to, uh, they didn't call me. I don't want to try to, uh, I feel so bad. You know what? I don't want to. Yeah. And, and the follow up is, is really, it's probably the most important part, but it sucks. I think it really is. It really is. So, and I've, I've realized sometimes I'll get on and I'll be, you know, looking at leads and I'm like, okay, I'll make an offer on that one. I'll make an offer on this one and make an offer on this one, close my computer and walk away. And like two or three days later, I'm like, Oh God, let me check. And I'll end up following up with them. Uh, sometimes I'll actually send a second email and a text message and just say, Hey, you know, we sent you an email. We said that we were interested in your property. You know, if you're interested, please get back with us. Sometimes they didn't get the email. Sometimes I went to their spam folder. So here I am thinking I'm being rejected and they didn't even get to get the offer. <clears throat> so yeah, follow up is good. Follow up is yeah. important. I actually just had a, um, this isn't a property, but it is real estate related. I can't really name the website, but I, uh, I had an article I wrote and I thought it'd be, I mean, it would have made a good article for my website, but I felt like it was good enough that I could try to put it on a bigger website and get some, get out there a little bit. So I, I emailed them, never heard back. Like a month later, I emailed the same person again, never heard back. And then like last week I was like, okay, I'm going to email it. I'm going to attach it. And I'm going to change all the words in the email and try one last time. And I got an email back yesterday basically saying, Hey, yeah, actually the article looks good, but how about instead of, you know, us posting that article for you, you write for us every week for the rest of the year. And mm. I was like, Oh, okay. Like that's a lot of work, but, uh, the payoff will be huge cause it's getting my name out there a little bit, but it's just, you know, right. something like most, most people would have sent an email or two, not gotten a response and said, all right, well, but for me, it's so much easier via email. I don't like bugging people on the phone too much. I think part of that's from recruiting. Cause you get told to go to hell a lot on recruiting duty and you just get sick of it. And so yeah. email so much nicer. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. That way you don't have to hear the, the cussing and stuff. They may be doing it, but you, you don't have to be at the <laughs> end of it. <laughs> you know, I, which is funny that I actually made an offer one time and this guy sends me back an email cussing at me, calling me names. Uh, it, you know, I'm not even going to go into all the detail that he said, but you know, he's like, you know, you must think I'm some sort of idiot. I'm stupid or something. You're trying to take advantage of me. I said, I made you a fair offer. I'm, you don't have to accept it, but you don't need to call and cuss at me. He uh, called me back six months later and he says, hey, is that offer still open? Would you consider it? And I'm, and I'm like, who is this? Why? It sounds kind of familiar. I said, let me, let me look at my information. So I'm sitting with him on the phone and I'm like looking through my stuff. And I'm like, oh, it's you. You. <laughs> like, no, no, man. I said, I am not doing business with you. 
and I walked away. It may have been a good deal. I don't know, but it just it made me feel good to get back at it, you know, just to say, up yours, dude. <laughs> That's it. It's always, I mean, even if an opportunity, there's a, Tim Ferriss talks about it. And there's a couple people, and this is not something I'm great at, but I want to get better. The art of saying no. And it, because, you know, if you're good at something or, or even if you're not like being able to say no to things is an art. Cause if you say yes to everything, right, you'll have no time to do anything, exactly. but it's hard to say no in a way that doesn't sound like, sorry, I don't have time for that. Right. Like there's an art to it and I'm trying to get better at it. Cause as I'm getting busier, it's getting, I'm getting more and more requests for things. But like, when you figure that out, let me know. Cause I, I haven't got real good at it yet because I mean, everybody's like, Oh, Hey Jim, you're doing real, real well with real estate. Teach me how to do it. <laughs> yeah, dude. Let me just like open your head, put it in. Close your, <laughs> now you, now you can do what I'm doing. You know, it's like, it's it like, get time. Degree, man. it takes, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes studying and it takes trial and error. It, you know, it takes many, many failures. I mean, I, I know you know as well as I do. I mean, you get turned down a lot. Yeah. You know, sometimes your deals go south. I have actually had lawsuits. I'm in know? one right now. Yeah, I mean. Although that, I'm actually yeah. suing someone, but, you know, still. Well, I mean, I, I, I have never, I haven't been on the suing end. I'm usually on the getting sued end. <laughs> um, you know, and one time I actually went to court. I actually did go to court just because the, the attorney had, had insulted me. And I'm like, you know what? I'll play this game. Uh, usually when the, the attorney will send me something, it'll say, you know, according to my client, you did this and you did this and you didn't give him back this. And then I'll highlight the part of the contract from those very same people, send it back to that attorney. And every stinking time the attorney will say, Either these people are no longer my client. Sorry to have disturbed you. Started, sorry to have taken up your time. You know, as long as your paperwork is good, it's ironclad. So I ended up going to court one time in Abilene. And the, uh, both my attorney and the mediation attorney both said, Jim, this is the best contract I've ever seen. They said, this thing is ironclad. They can't get you on nothing, no matter what you do. You could go and light their house on fire, burn it down, whatever. They have given you permission to do anything you want, and they have also agreed not to take you to court or sue you or anything. I'm like, well, if they have agreed not to take me to court or sue me, then why am I here? Because they're suing you. I said, well, what is my response? And he's like, you don't even have to be here. This is a waste of your time. <laughs> I'm like, really? They said, they can't do anything. So I got up and I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then as I was going through the door, I turned around and gave them all one last little, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and, and out the door. And it was over. Never heard a word uh, until about six months later when the people that tried to sue me, they, uh, I got a letter from their attorney through my attorney. And it said, it said, <laughs> You mean that we paid you $5,000 and you told us we was going to make all this money by suing this rich real estate guy and now we're not getting nothing and we still owe you $10,000. So they ended up owing this, this attorney, their attorney, like $15,000 and they got nothing. You know, some people are just greedy. Yep. You know, sometimes people just say, how can I get back at this guy or how can I, you know, and the, ultimately what happened was they had sold me their house six months later, they changed their mind. It says in there, I, I agree, I will not change my mind. It's, it's even, it's, I think, number three on one of, the, one of the contracts. I agree, I will not change my mind. If, if anything happens, I agree, I will not sue you. <laughs> so nobody's ever beat me. That's I've been awesome. doing this 15 years. When I get something from an attorney now, I'm just like, okay, whatever. And I haven't had that in a long time. But, you know, that's just something. If you're going to be in real estate, you got to expect eventually it's going to happen. And the first time my guts were turning, I was a nervous wreck. And, and now I don't even blink because, you know, as long as you're in the right and you're doing the right thing, your paperwork is good. You really don't have anything to worry about. So, I mean, I do the sub two. Uh, I also do, I, I, I buy also with owner financing. Uh, I was driving down the road one time going to visit my mother-in-law and I had my website on the back window of my truck. And I got a lead because all my leads funneled into my website. And then I would get an email saying, you've got new leads. Uh, so I called them up and they wanted $15,000 for a house. that was probably a 40 or $50,000 house. It was completely paid off. And uh, no, no, they went $25,000. So I, I told them, I said, I said, it's not worth 25. I said, 
I don't, it's not worth 25 to me. I said, you, you may be looking at it and seeing that, oh, it's worth 30, 40. To me, it's not worth that much. I said, tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll give you $15,000 just through the email. So they come back and they said, um, okay, we'll be willing to do that. And I said, well, here's the thing. I said, I will give you $15,000. I said, but I'm only going to give you $300 a month until the whole thing is paid off. And then they said, uh, okay, we'll do that. So I went, looked at it. It was all cleaned up and ready to go. I moved somebody in there. They gave me a little bit of money down and I think I'm getting 600 bucks a month off of that one. And it's already paid off, paid it off in like two years. I even called him up. I, I, I read somewhere, uh, one of those little hack things that you can do. I, I owed him a, probably about $7,000, which was what I had left. It was about halfway paid off. So I called him up and said, tell you what I'm going to do. Instead of paying you $300 a month, I'm going to give you $3,000 cash right now. If you'll just say we're even, he's like, Oh no, man, I want that 300 bucks a month. I'm living off that 300 bucks a month. I'm like, all right, fine. <laughs> but that was one of those little, one of those little hacks that I had learned. Not a bad idea. I might have that, to do that. I've, I've got some seller financing on one of my 10 units right now. Um, like he bridged the mortgage and uh, so I didn't have to put much down at all. So I may, may call them up here and be like, Hey, you know, set up yeah, I mean, because it's like 180 it, it, bucks a month. Yeah, exactly. It, if, if I had, I think it was right after a tax return, I got like a $5,000 check. I called them up and said, Hey, I'll give you 3000. If you'll, and, no, 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 we can't do that. So I'll tell you what, I'll give you 4,000. I'll give you $4,000 and you wipe off that 7,000. I figured I was going to take that 15,000 and bring it down to 12. So then I would buy that house for 12,000. He wouldn't go for it. But yeah. I ended up paying it down and now the house has paid off and it's bringing in 600 bucks a month, free and clear every month. That's awesome. All right, Jim, well, uh, let's run through some, some questions. I always ask some of my guests and uh, we'll uh, go from there. Um, All right. So if, a, if a young 18, 20 year old was to walk up to you, ask you for advice and you had just a moment, what, what would be the one thing you'd want to tell him? If he was just asking me for general advice, I would say invest in real estate for the long term, not for the short term, but for long term, I would say study and learn everything you can after you have a good understanding of, of real estate, you know, study finance because you either are on the receiving end of finance or you are on the losing end of finance. Because if you understand finance, you're going to do well. If you don't, everybody's going to be taking advantage of you. Uh, get into real estate long term learn everything you can study finance uh, and just keep learning. Never stop learning. That's yeah. and never be afraid to, to, to take a chance, make some offers. Matter of fact, I think, I think it's pretty much the same thing. I just told my son, I think he's 23 and he's just, he, he's, Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then he comes back and says, dad, none of this stuff is working. I just, how can I do real estate like you? And I told him, I said, get rich dad, poor dad by Robert Kiyosaki. I said, first thing you need to do is read that book and get your mind right. You know, in high school, they train us to learn skills, to get a job and work for someone else. No, you, you get your mind right. Instead of, instead of working hard for your money, have your money working hard for you. You know, that's the key. Uh, and the way you're going to do that is by cash flow. And the best way to get your cash flow is long-term cash flowing real estate. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a definite believer. That would be my advice. Awesome. And that's good advice to give. All right. Uh, so you mentioned Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But uh, outside of that, what's, uh, what's one resource, uh, you know, book, course, website, whatever, that you would recommend to anybody trying to get started in real estate? Uh, well, like I said, what I do is I, I like having all my marketing funnel into one place, which is my website. Um, and part of me paying for a monthly website goes into marketing. So I get, I get leads from people that I didn't even market to. They just are searching on the internet and they find the website and they say, Hey, look, please buy my house. So, I mean, any day of the week, I would rather have people beating on my door, begging me to buy their house than me having to bang on theirs and getting yelled at cussed at. So, uh, like I said, the, the website is uh, Super Smart Web Profits, Dustin Griffin, and he's got 
real estate websites and he's got really good ones. So that's one resource that I would say is definitely worth considering. Awesome. Um, uh, resources. There's uh, several of the real estate sites. Was it REI something? REI.com. Uh, there's several of, of the different uh, real estate websites that are out there that have a lot of good information, a lot of good articles. Uh, I can't think of the name offhand. Uh, you've mentioned it before because I remember when you, oh, yeah, I love that thing. So I went and started looking at it again. Bigger Pockets? Bigger Pockets. Yeah, that's one that I'm a big fan of. Yeah, I like that one. That's good. But that's a, that's a good resource. It, it's not expensive. Yeah, something that I used to do is just on Sunday afternoons, I would go to, uh, go to the bookstore and get me one of those big old cappuccinos and I'd go and pick up two or three books on real estate and go and sit down and I would just be sitting drinking my coffee for two or three hours going through those books. And if one of those books actually had really good information, I would get it. Sometimes I would go through it and I'm like, all right, I already know all that. Okay. I already know all this. I'm looking for something new. And when you first start, everything is new. Yeah. But then as you get going, you, the information, you know, you're looking for something new and not just the same thing over and over again. Uh, so once I would find something, and I've got a big library, uh, I ended up after, uh, after my wife passed away, I couldn't, I couldn't live in the house that we lived in because it was, it was her house. Uh, ended up buying a 4,250 square foot, two story on three and a half acres. Um, it was house. huge. It, it was five bedroom, three and a half baths, had an in-ground pool. Uh, it was about, I don't know, eight miles from town outside of Greenville uh, in Texas. Uh, the guy, I just happened to be driving by and, you know, I see the house and the grass was overgrown. There was a little sign out front and it said for sale, but the, house, the sign was kind of falling over. So I got out and I looked at it and I called the guy up. Come to find out they were like one week away from going into foreclosure. So I told him, I said, tell you what I'm going to do. I am going to buy your house. I said, I'm going to do that by taking over your existing financing for the balance on your mortgage. I said, yes, the mortgage will stay in your name. However, I will be responsible for all the payments and everything from here going forward. I said, you will have no closing costs. You will have no fees. You have zero out of pocket. And I said, and next month, I said, I will be paying your bill. He's like, well, it's going into foreclosure. I said, within the next six months, I'll have it caught up. That's going to save your credit. And that's exactly what I did. I ended up putting a hundred thousand dollars of my money and fixed up that house. Uh, I did the, the, the foundation and, and a lot of work on it. Spent a couple years working on it. <clears throat> ended up being beautiful, beautiful house. And uh, then I realized, you know what? I don't want to live here anymore. I want to do something different. So I turned around and did a lease option on it. Got a big chunk down and came to the Caribbean. That's so awesome. I can go scuba diving. <laughs> what a cool, cool way to end up in the Caribbean. <laughs> that, that is, it is pretty cool. I, I would, I, I was hesitating. I'm like, you know, I put so much work in this house and I've done this. I mean, I got a pool out back, you know? And uh, I'm like, well, the, the Caribbean is one big pool. Yeah. And yeah, you tired of scuba diving in your I'm tired of scuba diving in my, in my pool, kept bumping into the, to the edges. So. <laughs> exactly. Oh man, that's so cool. All right. Well, before we wrap this up, is there anything uh, that you want to add? Any parting advice? I, I think I have pretty much given. There's been a lot in there. The best advice I have. Um, little things, little things like uh, avoid bad debt, take on good debt. You know, what is the difference between good debt and bad debt? And that's things that these people need to be researching and looking, you know, you, you go down and buy you a brand new car because it's cool. That's not good debt. That's bad debt. You go down and buy a house. Yeah. It's a 50, 60, $70,000 mortgage, but you're making money off of it. It's appreciating. You get to write it off on your taxes. So you get to write off depreciation. You're making money. That's good debt. So understand the difference between good debt and bad debt. Um, have your money working for you. So put money aside, but don't save money just to save money, save money with a purpose. You know, I'm going to save up $10,000 and I'm going to use this $10,000 to go put, you know, 10% down on a hundred thousand dollar investment property. 
You know, I love the the house hacking stuff that that, that y'all been talking about. You know, using the you know, I don't actually plan on living in one of them. I'm still trying to figure that part out. <laughs> Maybe I'll just have that as a mailing address or something. And so I don't know. I, I don't want to leave the Caribbean. I want to live here, but I want to have that fourplex over there, and I want to use yeah. my VA. I've never even used my VA. Yeah, it's a pretty cool opportunity. Well, yeah. I'm gonna follow up with you more about that. Yeah, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a way to work that where that's your primary residence and you're just on vacation right now for a long, I'm on a long vacation in the Caribbean. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's my thinking. I'm figuring that one out. I've already called, uh, called my banker, uh, after, after I was listening to y'all on doing the house hacking, I said, you know, I've never, I've never used my VA. That would be a good way, another way. And it just adds something to the skills that I already have. So there's exactly. something else. Keep adding skills. Don't get too distracted. You know, a lot of people get distracted. Oh, I'm going to try this. Oh, I'm going to try that. Oh, no, you got too much going on. Learn something and then add a skill to that. You know, I learned subject two, and then learned how to get rid of the house with the, uh, the, uh, uh, lease options. That was all I knew. Buying subject two, selling it back in was lease options. And then I found, you know, that I could buy it with owner financing. I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. And uh, then I learned how to sell with owner financing. So then you're adding multiple little bags of tricks, multiple skills. Uh, then I got into doing short sales. Then I did a little of this and then a little of that. So, I mean, after you've got something down, add something to your skills. Always be learning. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So, Jim, where can people get a hold of you? Uh, well, I've got a, my email, which is Jim, J I M, at Fresh, F R E S H, start investments, that's plural, LLC.com. Yes, it is long. So it is Jim at Fresh Start Investments, LLC.com. That's my email. Easy day. I'll, I'll link that below in the show notes so people can, people can see it. That way they don't have to remember it. There you go. Easy day. Jim, I really appreciate you coming on this show. It's been a pleasure. Uh, one of these days, I might have to come down there and grab a beer with you. But, uh, hey, man. Well, not today, though, because today they're doing elections, so there's no drinking. Oh, what kind of mess is that? Everybody loves drunk, drunkenly yeah. electing politicians. I, I have no idea. It, this <laughs> is the, the, the second time since we, we've been here that they just nobody's allowed to, to sell alcohol. Uh, fortunately... Uh, we said, okay, there's going to be three days for the election that they're not going to be able to sell alcohol. So we went to the store ahead of time, stocked up on rum because we're in the Caribbean. <laughs> got to drink some rum. There's yeah. all the rum. So we got plenty of rum. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, Jim, have a great day. Thanks for joining us. All right, my brother. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you for listening to another episode about my journey from military to millionaire. If you liked it, be sure to visit from military to millionaire.com slash podcast to subscribe to future podcasts. While you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show, give us a review on iTunes. Now get out there and take action.